This is Pankaj Gupta. Thanks a lot for joining today's session on transformation and innovation in the tech space. Uh, we are Ethom Venture Partners, a deep tech accelerator based in Singapore. Uh, we have approximately 56 startups in our portfolio. All of these are AI, ML, blockchain, IoT, robotics, AI. We are kind of startups from different parts of the world, stages and sectors. Explico is one of our portfolio startup, which is uh, doing some interesting things in the tech space by offering uh, assessment for, for, for students at the PSLE and K-12 levels. Why we wanted to have this panel, uh, this, this round table or webinar, because we really feel that there's a lot which is happening in that tech space. And, and, and because there's so much happening in the ed tech space, it is very interesting. It would be very interesting to hear all the inputs from the policy making side, from the government side, or from uh, organizations like AWS, or from entrepreneurs, or from the ed tech uh, innovators uh, and, and, and investors, and so on and so forth. And that's why we wanted to have this event and really hear all these inputs, insights about how ed tech space is evolving and what we can expect to see in next uh, couple of years, and so on and so forth. Again, we have Explico with us. Uh, we have Sandesh and Ashu, who are the co-founders of Explico. And then we have a fantastic panel, which is very diverse. And uh, I would I would pass it on to Sandesh, who will briefly talk about Explico, and then we will get into a panel introduction and then some fantastic question that I'm sure Sandesh is going to ask. One request that I have to everybody is that uh, please keep yourself muted when you are not talking. But when you have some interesting insight or question to ask, please feel free to put that in chat. Uh, and we will take the question as we move along. Uh, Sandesh, over to you. Please go ahead. Uh, please unmute. Thanks, Pankaj. Uh, thanks for introducing us. And uh, of course, uh, let me first welcome all the attendees and of course, uh, the guest who will be part of our panel. Uh, I think uh, the, uh, the responses for this entire event has been overwhelming. And uh, uh, just to just to do your quick introduction of the people who don't know me, like uh, my name is Sandesh, and I'll uh, be the host and the moderator for this today's event. So feel free to ask any questions. Uh, the overall ob objective uh, for this particular event, as I mentioned earlier, that edtech definitely is a very exciting space, and uh, there's a lot of things happening. And of course, with COVID coming in the last two years, I think uh, we are seeing a lot of innovations happening around, and uh, that's where. Uh, you know, being in the education space for almost 15 years, uh, I went on to co-found Xpico along with my co-founder Ashutosh in 2019. Uh, in Xpico, what we are trying to do is we are bringing the whole assessment-based learning system that uses AI and machine learning, which can help to analyze, identify, and predict the student's academic weakness and strength. So once that part is done, it becomes much easier for us to have the uh, structured learning for these students and, uh, you know, uh, structure the learning objectives. So one thing what we have been seeing around in the ed tech space is that uh, there's a lot of solutions which are coming into the market and uh, sometimes it's good. You know, and sometimes uh, we also have to look at that uh, with too many options, uh, the effectiveness also decreases with time. And that has happened with most of the products. And that's where we felt that as Xpico, we can get into a niche area, which is going to be the assessment. And how uh, you know uh, in in depth and how analytical we can be using the various latest technologies like AI. We have been working closely with AWS on that path, and see how much uh, you know uh, learning solutions we can provide for the students. So that's what we are trying to do right now. Uh, we are already present in Singapore and Africa, and we are now also having uh, some beta projects going on in Philippines, in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's going to be an exciting phase, and. Um, We'll be, we'll be talking about it more often. Uh, but I think um, what we are um, you know, gathered here today is, is to discuss, discuss about the education as in whole and uh, where that technology is moving, uh, what are the plans for the future and uh, what, is the, what is going to be the era after COVID. And um, I would like to again welcome all my guests. The, the best thing about this panel is we have got four individuals from different perspective of education. So we have got somebody representing the big five. We have got somebody who has gone through the ed tech era for the last uh, 20 years. We have got somebody who has been working closely with the government and the policymaking um, in Singapore. 
and then we have somebody who has been involved in the operation and academic management so uh, that's that's all about uh, what uh, expico is and what we are doing I'll, I'll not waste much time about it and uh, we'll have enough opportunity to talk about expico but let me straight away get back into introducing the panel so my first guest is mr erkong wa Ekong Wa was permanent secretary in Singapore's Ministry of Education from 1987 to 1994. And then he took out the portfolio in Ministry of Community Development in 1998, after which he has been served as chairman and director in various public ministry companies. So he has been keenly involved in a lot of policy making, especially in the education. And we all know that Singapore education system is one of the most sorted out systems in the world. <laughs> And uh, that's where he has been actively involved. I think we'll be hearing a lot of insights from him. He has also been conferred with uh, a public administration medal from the government of France um, in 1991. Uh, my second guest is Michael, Michael Clem. Michael Clem has been involved in various universities and institutions in Southeast Asia. So he understands the whole ecosystem of education. Uh, he has also been involved in uh, NTUC Learning Hub, I think most of the people know in Singapore about it. And of course, he was part of NUS where he was uh, spearheading the entire South Asia, Asia market for NUS. Um, interestingly, he also co-founded a Singapore education network where he's bringing in all the educa educators, education technology platforms where they can come in one single platform and look out for partnerships and try to learn from each other. I think that's a, that's a great initiative, uh, which I think as an ed tech uh, company as myself, I think uh, you know, we can reach out to a lot many people through this platform. And uh, right now, he's also a startup mentor to many startups. Uh, he's involved with few accelerators in Singapore, like EduSpace and 500 startups. My third guest is comes from a very different perspective. That is from the corporate side. And I think um, uh, Mr. Ivan. Mr. Ivan has been involved with the AWS Ed Start program. And I think that becomes very much essential. Uh, for big companies to work with smaller companies and see how they can support us in terms of reaching out markets, in terms of uh, technology support. I think uh, that's that's where most of the smaller startups are not able to reach out fast. And that's where I think uh, this brings a whole lot initiative for us. And um, he has also been involved with Singapore's Ministry of Education. He was uh, the former head of strategy and policy making and uh, wherein he was uh, working with key education market like US, European Union and Australia. So he has got that kind of an experience, which he'll be, we'll be having some discussion with him on that perspective. Uh, the fourth gentleman in our panel is Mr. JJ. Uh, he actually, we call him as that he wears a lot of hats, uh, one man with many hats. So he's an author, he's an entrepreneur. Uh, he was the one who started uh, the very early days uh, at tech startup in Singapore. And he has gone to the 360 cycle of, of a startup from uh, founding to exit. Uh, he has been in the uh, in the member of parliament in Singapore and he has been continuous speaker of politics and education. Um, he's also a magician, uh, amateur magician he calls himself. And now he's also uh, having a keen interest in, uh, in arts, uh, that is uh, painting, music and all. And he's also building a technology around it. So uh, yes, uh, welcome you all to this event and we look forward to uh, hearing from you, uh, there will be some questions uh, uh, regarding your own perspective uh, segment. But before that, I would like to just go one by one and just, uh, you know, you can share your quick thoughts about this entire thing before I move into the questions. So maybe Mikhail, we can start with Mr. Eric Wongwa. You are muted, muted Mr. Wong. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sandesh, and uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, as you said, I was a permanent secretary in the 80, late 80s and the early 90s. So uh, my comment may be a bit dated, but uh, having left the Ministry of Education, uh, I still kept in touch with education. And uh, early part of it, when I was in the service, yes, we formulated a lot of policies and so on. But when I retire, okay, uh, I end up the receiving end through the through my children and uh, my grandchildren, uh, as well, then in the schools, and that is where the digitization and the online learning and all that has been 
felt through the family. Now, uh, one would have thought that uh, online learning uh, was given a big push by COVID-19, but actually it's not, that wasn't the starting point. The starting point for, the, for Singapore is way before that. In fact, actually in the 70s, the computerization, digitization already started and government pumped in a lot of money setting up the National Computer Board and so on. But those were the old days, you know, with the old technology. And um, the first realization on the importance of online learning actually uh, started more than 10 years ago during the time of SARS, when the schools, uh, the kids will have to rely on home-based learning. So during the whole period, coupled with the digitization effort, with a very strong government support. Okay. Actually, the ministry in the last few years actually had been preparing for a day when kids have to learn from home. Okay. And um, I find that uh, in the over the last 10 years, okay, online learning in the private sector was also developing, but not to the extent of the people's parents' acceptance. Um, there were many efforts uh, by private companies to launch the various like Blackboard and so on. But I think now the Singapore government has done the right thing over the past in terms of policy in preparing for the day when we really need the uh, online learning to support the home-based learning, especially during this period of the pandemic. And we don't know how long this would, would, uh, will carry on. Uh, it will be on and off, I suppose, for the next few years. But uh, in terms of infrastructure and so on, um, I can say that we, we are very advanced and we're very ready for, for a day like this. Um, so online learning, home-based learning is going to be the norm uh, from now in the future. With better development in technology, more effective uh, means of uh, delivery, so the, the, the problem actually is not really a problem. It's actually the parents. The parents will have to keep, keep pace with, with uh, this sort of development. And it's not, not easy for parents, uh, even for, for me. Okay? I only heard from my grandchildren about the uh, school learning system. But I can tell you it's very effective because uh, wherever you are in the world, Singaporeans, I mean, they can still log on to our school system. In fact, uh, my, my own granddaughter who had to return from Dubai in the middle of, in the beginning of this year because of uh, the, the parents completed their overseas term. But my granddaughter was halfway through international school. But she is able to return to Singapore and continue her international education online and completed her year in Singapore. So th th that is another interesting thing. So even international schools, you can register for international school in any part of the world and you can still study without any loss uh, in contents. So you don't need to be physically present in that, in the country, you know. Uh, so I expect more of such uh, things to happen in the past, in, in the future. I mean. So... <laughs> That, that, yeah, that's, sure. that's what I think it will be. Yeah. So I think uh, I'll, I'll come back to you again because I have some questions ready for you, um, especially from the from the policy making. Um, I'll just quickly run through uh, probably Michael. Uh, if Michael can share his quick thoughts uh, before I go back to the other guests. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Sandesh. And thanks for inviting me to be part of the panel. It's a very interesting panel, and why I like it is because we are all here in the region. Okay, we, I've been to some other panels where you it's gl global ed tech is global is interesting, but I think education ed tech uh, also is actually very local. So in terms of Singapore Southeast Asian context, it's actually very different from the US or Europe. So it's it's nice to see that very nice breadth of expertise here, and and just just to uh, uh, say a few words about the topic we are talking about it. I think, make no mistake, we are in the midst of a revolution here. And it's really an education revolution. 
we had this before in other in other sectors, right? These really deep interruptions like fintech, but education, particularly triggered by the pandemic, has seen, as you rightly mentioned in your introduction, a a flood, almost a tsunami of of new solutions. Not all will survive, but this is we are in very interesting times in education. It it and, and education as such is a very complex uh, um, industry with public and private partners and many different stakeholders. But it's very interesting to be in Singapore for this because you are clearly a hub of education quality, but also education solutions. And uh, uh, hopefully Singapore as a, as a country with our solutions and, and partners, we can really um, spur uh, more innovations and also spread our wings into Southeast Asia or even beyond. I think we can make a real difference in, in the next three to five years. Thank you. Sandesh, you are muted. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so uh, I was just saying, yeah, Michael, yeah, even we believe that the uh, tech is going through a lot. And um, yeah, we are going to see a lot of innovations happening uh, for the good. Uh, one thing COVID has done definitely is that uh, the adaptability. I think uh, now people are more adaptive to the online learning, which was like a lot of resistance in the past. So yeah, yeah it, it will be interesting. Uh, yes, definitely uh, there's more to discuss with you. Uh, let me quickly move to Mr. Jen Jong and, um, you know, sharing his thought because he comes from this space from early 2000. So I think there's a lot has changed what he started off. So a quick thought on this, uh, uh, Mr. JJ. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sandesh. And uh, yeah, nice to be here with uh, so many distinguished uh, uh, panelists and uh, uh, participants. Okay, just to share uh, a few thoughts. Firstly, I'm privileged to be um, in the early days of EdTech um, in Asia Pacific. I started us and learn in the end of 1999. Initially, it was to do um, B2C learning for Singapore school-age children. But we uh, switched very quickly to B2B because uh, we did not receive enough funding when the, um, the NASDAQ crashed in early 2000. So we decided that... Uh, we wanted to be more focused on servicing the schools instead. So we, we ended up servicing um, Singapore schools to do e-learning for them. Um, we managed to get some breakthrough after SARS and we grew to be a, servicing about 40% of all the schools in Singapore. We sold the business to a public listed firm uh, in early 2007 and uh, I left the business in 2009. And uh, since then, I've been doing a number of other stuff, uh, which uh, had been introduced earlier. Um, but it includes a mentoring a few other ad techs. So I'm still keeping in touch with the ad tech space. Uh, authored a book that been in Singapore's parliament for the last, for five years. And I also uh, ran a few education ventures. So my thoughts on ad tech is that, yes, gone through a pretty big um, transformation since those early days. Um, I remember the struggles that we had when um, the teachers themselves were quite new to technology and you had to, uh, ask them to create content. And those days, creation of content is not as easy as today. There's not so many video-based uh, tools and all that. Um, bandwidth was very uh, expensive and difficult. So it was not easy for them to create quizzes and, and, and other stuff. Okay. Uh, I also remember that um, um, when we started to venture into China, so we did a project with um, this um, um, China construction bank and um, then we had to, that was just before the Olympics, uh, two years before the Olympics, they wanted to make sure that every frontline staff must pass basic conversational English to get themselves ready for the Olympics. So uh, definitely there was no way they're going to get 6,000 staff trained uh, within two years. Uh, so they, they, they opted for e-learning and China was then in this infancy right, in, in e-learning. So today, if you look at China, it is leading the world in terms of uh, the use of uh, artificial intelligence in learning. It leads in uh, lots of areas of ad tech in terms of the number of students uh, that are on it. Uh, in fact, China leads in a lot of things, including fintech, uh, e-commerce. And also today, we have a lot of huge markets like India. India is now home to one of the top ad tech company by market valuation. And you also see like near... Near to us, uh, Indonesia and Vietnam are catching on 
very fast. So it's certainly very exciting times and definitely the market is a lot more ready to adopt e-learning compared to where it was 20 years ago when we started. We had to do a lot of education to just to uh, convince people why they even need something like that. Thanks. Hey, hey, thanks, JJ. Um, I think, yeah, I think uh, Southeast Asia definitely is, is becoming like a, you know, epicenter for ed tech. Uh, it was uh, earlier dominated by China and then India. Now we are seeing a lot of startups. Even in Singapore, we are hearing a lot of um, new startups coming in, raising investments. So uh, I think uh, one more, more important uh, thing which is uh, happening, especially for the ed tech, is that we are seeing a lot of big corporates coming and joining hands. And um, that's where I would like to hear Ivan's comment, uh, because I think Amazon, which uh, is basically an, uh, started off as a retail and today they are involved in uplifting a lot of ed tech startups across the globe with their technology. Uh, so uh, I think it will be good to hear from Ivan, like what is the main objective? What is the vision which we see from these corporations and what they see in our startups, like the small startups with, and uh, how they see as a market, uh, you know, uh, uh, what do you say, a market kind of a leader uh, and how they can contribute into these startups. Hi, thanks Andesh and uh, the rest of the team for inviting me for this panel. Uh, my name is Ivan. So uh, broadly speaking, um, so I started my career as a teacher. So I'm, uh, I actually started teaching in schools uh, and then I did various work um, before working now at AWS. Um, so the opinions here are mainly my own and I don't represent my employer. That's, that's something to note. Uh, that's, but um, I, I think there are many things we need to think about, um, especially for big corporations. And it is really in everyone's interest to get education out there and to scale education that at this, in the previous world before COVID, we were very much restrained by physical constraints. Now, digitally, things are going to also be very different. Um, and it's really about rethinking and reimagining education uh, rather than just doing incremental changes, right? Uh, we really want to see how we can empower uh, everyone to rethink, reimagine education and to be impactful and thoughtful when it comes to education. There are a lot of things that can be done, um, but we do want to help ad techs around the world really solve all the problems that they think they can have. And there are a lot of unsexy problems out there in education that I think uh, we don't tackle and we should really think about some of these problems. Thank you, Sandesh. Okay. Hey, uh, thanks, Ivan. So I think I'll uh, quickly move into the questions. There are some questions coming up in the chat as well. Uh, I'll try to take it one by one. Uh, before that, uh, before that, um, I just want to understand Mr. from Mr. Kwong Wo. I mean, one question which probably haunts me also uh, being in this business is that uh, many times we hear education, government taking a lot of changes in education and technology. And most of the tech companies are, um, you know, seeing a, a, a lot of hesitation working with governments, you know, due to, you know, regular policy changing, or probably they feel it's a, it's a too many hierarchies to go through to, to get a deal done. So uh, do you think this system is good enough, a robust system still, or you feel that probably the government should be more open working with startups um, and see that how they can build a solution which could benefit both of them? Um, it, it's something which how the, the big corporates have started opening up. You know, they have started, they don't have the fear of working with smaller startups. I think, do you feel that even government should look at that angle as well? I think they're not, probably not directly. Normally the government will go through the, one of the statutory board that the enterprise Singapore or even the universities the start up in that sense with more by way of funding other than by direct involvement in, uh, in making the startup. So that that's that's always been the case all these all these years that I know of. But um, I know there's a lot of innovations in a in the private sector. And I think one of the big challenges actually the private sector is facing is the contents not so much the technology, but the actual content to so suit whichever education system that is uh, uh, that is needed. And um, that is the most expensive part. Developing the contents is very expensive. So only the ministry can afford that, you see, so they can have enough uh, resources just to develop the contents. 
and then they buy the technology, the, the contents of the technology, and then deliver it to the students. But personally, I would like to see some changes in future on, the, on, on our school system. Uh, you know, kids wake up very early in the morning and the school starts at 7.30. You know, they have to rush to school, not enough sleep, they have a sleep, not, not enough, uh, did not take the breakfast. But with uh, online learning, there could be a blend of uh, in-person as well as uh, uh, online presence and education. In other words, uh, there will come a day where you don't have to uh, attend school five days a week, maybe maybe three days and then a two days of home-based learning, that sort of thing. And also you can adjust the timing, the, the, the school hours, start time and the, at the end time, as well as do a lot of the homework online in the school, in the class, or even at home, so that uh, the kids do not have to stay up late uh, in the evening just to finish the homework and then have not enough sleep, next day got to go to school again. Um, I would like to see such changes that will make student life uh, easier and uh, more free time for them to, to develop themselves, you know, in, in the hobbies, in, uh, in new things, in things that they, but not playing games all the time on the, on the, on the phone. You know? mm -hmm. So if you're talking about uh, startups and so on, uh, I have not seen the any ministry that has direct uh, involvement in that. Usually, it's through grant, through a statutory bond. But the net effect is the same. But if you add up all the funding that comes from government in this area, I think it's quite quite a lot, eh? because it's not just one particular ministry or statutory bond. It's uh, quite pervasive in, in all the ministries. Especially over the last four or five years, and then the and, and the coming years in the area of digitization, which is also related to some extent on the online. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Mr. Boy. I mean, uh, this actually takes me to my next question to Mr. Jen Jong. I think uh, uh, this question is something which always uh, clicks on the mind of most of the startups. So we always have this identity crisis, you know. Uh, like whether we are a tech company or we call ourselves as an education company. It's just like, you know, Grab has the same problem. And, uh, you know, most of the, like, for example, even I can, I can say for AWS, which started off as, a, as something on a retail without having owning none of the brands or none of the shops. So I think similarly, we also have that similar identity crisis, whether we should be presenting ourselves as a, as a tech company or as an education company. So what's your thought? Because being in this space for a long time, I think you'll ha definitely have some insights on it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, before I go into answering your question, then I just want to add a little to um, what Mr. Er mentioned earlier, uh, which is definitely very valid because uh, I was in the space that was trying to sell to Ministry of Education, to schools and so on. Uh, it was quite tough uh, until, of course, uh, SARS happened and then the schools started to come knocking at our doors. You know, the ministry started to ask the schools to push. But um, on the part about um, uh, how to encourage startups and innovation and uh, that, um, one of the things that was very interesting and was a personal experience that I went through was that we started at a time that the government was trying to encourage broadband. And those days they were uh, using the computer um, IDA. Those days it was called IDA, uh, which is a stat board like Mr. Er mentioned. They will go through the stat board to try to promote um, education use in, in broadband. And then they themselves, the uh, idea was trying to convince the MOE to use it. Uh, of course, MOE was reluctantly giving them a few schools here and there to try out and so on. Um, but I wanted to push that at a policy level, we can start to look at sandbox. We ourselves benefited a lot from this sandboxing thing where we came into the, we managed to break into the MOE market in the early days. We switched from B to C to B to B because uh, of that broadband initiative and because of the grants that uh, IDA was giving out through the schools to, to appoint companies like us. 
So because of that sandbox, we managed to create a solution. And then when SARS happened, we had the perfect solution to meet whatever the schools needed. And then from there, we scaled up very quickly. So, you know, there was something that I was passionately also pushing for in parliament that we should create more sandboxing opportunities for our local startups to be able to break into ministries project because directly the ministries themselves don't really want to engage startups and, and that's a perennial problem. Okay, anyway, back to your, your question about the um, identity crisis. I think it really depends uh, what space you want to be because ultimately, wherever you are going into, you want to be a market leader and it's very, very crowded uh, space in the in the tech business. I see some of the questions in the, in the, on the, by the participants asking about yeah, this being a very crowded space. So, so we need to... Okay, my, my own experience, when I started Us and Learned, we wanted to be a platform provider, a tech platform for the schools. But we found out very quickly that if we go into the schools and we have no content, there's no way we're going to sell. So we forced ourselves to create content. We built up um, with a shoestring budget. We managed to like get ex-teachers into our team. We get tech people. We built content. And we actually uh, piloted with schools to build content. And that helped to jumpstart the whole process. Yeah, so, um, so for us, uh, in order to be in the space we needed to be, um, being a technology provider uh, would not gain us the market share. So we had to force ourselves to create content. And um, there are very few ad tech companies that can purely call themselves a tech company without uh, dabbling into content. Uh, one of the examples I can think of is the granddaddy of the learning management system, which is Blackboard. Blackboard doesn't create content. They still provide a platform for schools and, and corporates to use, right? But they are the early um, players in the market. They have some market share, but still their market is being threatened now by people with uh, cheaper platforms or open source platform. And the challenge of an uh, ad tech to, if you just want to be um, a platform player or technology player, uh, and if you are based out of a country like Singapore, you'll find that it's going to be very challenging. If you want to be a leader in the technology side of ad tech, then you really need to define the global standards. And that is something that is honestly very challenging for a Singapore-based company to be defining world standard. You have to break into the biggest market in the world, which is US or China these days, and then establish a standard, then you have a, a chance. So I think also... Um, yeah, tech, you have to decide what age range you want to get into. So uh, because tech itself is very wide, it can be all the way from young kids to um, adults, corporate learners, and so on. So um, yeah, and it is quite hard for, um, for tech to be something for everybody initially. So you've got to start out by being very focused on a particular market. And maybe if you receive funding, you can go on acquisition or to expand your brand out. But usually it'll be very focused on building content for a specific area, have a breakthrough, have the market niche, then you can expand. Okay, thanks. Hey, hey thanks, uh, JJ, for this detailed explanation. I think um, we still, as a, as a company, have to figure out in which domain we are standing right now as a technology and uh, um, as an education. I think that, that struggle is going to be there for some more time. Um, and I think it's a good struggle to be in. Um, so, so my next question would be for Michael. Uh, I think um, that the key component is that the, with so many solutions around, especially in education, we are talking about uh, the learning management system, the open source platforms. Uh, we are talking about the new innovations like AI, machine learning, augmented reality. Uh, how do you see as someone who has been in this education ecosystem saying that whether it is going to be really something which is beneficial to students is it going to make their life more easy or do you think it is going to be become more and more complex for them uh, you know taking up this uh, content and which is the best and how do the students choose that what is the right solution for for me to go ahead thanks sandesh very very um, relevant important question well i was 10 years with university so i have a stronger uh, perspective on how higher education how it works or how it doesn't work. And I was also two years with an American college called Minava University, which is a very interesting tech heavy uh, um, uh, hybrid model. But um, it definitely is more complex and particularly because we are currently in a transition period. Uh, many educators 
teachers, they are not fully aware or they are not fully um, trained to use these ed tech solutions. And for the, for the students as well, it takes time to adopt. But remember, as younger you are, as easy it is to learn the, these, this tech stuff, right? Kids uh, uh, nowadays, you know, we, this is the digital generation. So for them to pick up and learn uh, different digital tools is actually relatively fast, so to speak. The, the bottleneck, what I see is, is the adoption or the utilization from the teachers, professors, researchers, or the administration of those education institutions. And that is, again, and we are in the middle of a revolution, meaning that is a tsunami of different solutions all coming in uh, um, in the last one or two years. We had early adopters, early uh, companies, as uh, um, JJ was also mentioning, but obviously the last two years, um, completely changed because solutions which were looked at um, as only a second class solution, particularly online learning and online degree, which was like, okay, I, I'm not really sure is it recognized. Suddenly it's um, talk of a town, right? It's it's recognized, it's offered by by institutions, by well-known institutions, including NUS, NTU, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, just come back to your question, it's gonna be a bit more complex, but at the end of the day, what an ed tech solution should do, it should make life easier. Uh, and I think that's a starting point. Some people think ed tech is about putting offline learning online. I think that's a, that's a really wrong approach. Uh, um, uh, ed tech, at least many, they should make offline learning easier, save time. And then in terms of face-to-face -face learning, you have more time where a facilitator, a trainer, a coach, uh, a teacher can actually do what he or she is supposed to do, whereas online learning is uh, is an add-on. It saves time from the classroom. Um, and I think that's that's critically important. Secondly, that um, teachers, trainers, etc., cetera, are using ed tech, again, should save time. And this also make um, learning more impactful by giving them different data points in terms of assessment. So that's a different perspective. And that's a skill what many people need to be trained at. And that will take time. Uh, uh, so I don't think it will change over time. We, we are still in the phase where we need to figure out what, what is the most important aspect where we want an ed tech solution to help us if I would be an education institution. And then I need to train my staff, my teachers, my professors, my students. So that will still take a little bit of time and it will be a bit painful. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Michael. So uh, I, think, I think there are a lot of questions coming in uh, from our audiences. I think uh, before, I move into these questions. Um, uh, my last question to Ivan is that uh, since he's uh, been working with various startups uh, across Southeast Asia, there are there are a lot of new initiatives happening, new innovations happening. Uh, how do you see next ten years? I mean, uh, what is that uh, a technology in from the technology perspective? What is that you feel that there is uh, a completely different uh, you know technology coming in and taking over the entire learning? Uh, we are talking about augmented reality and all those stuffs, but uh, we are still not able to see that as a, as a part of the learning right now. Uh, it, it's still trying to find its steps into this uh, education system. So, what's your thought? What what's the future says? You know, where do we move from here, or do you feel that we are not done enough at this point to um, you know to reach out to the, all the users across the globe? Um, that, that's a great question. Um, so as part of the AWS Ad Start program, I work with a lot of startups, including Explico uh, and a lot of the ad tech startups in the region. And we see a lot of people doing many, many different things. What are some of the big trends that we see um, upcoming for the next 10 years? And these are, um, you know, they are the common ones that everyone knows, right? Going online. Um, let's talk about something bigger, something more difficult, uh, really big, hairy problems. In, in tech um, that everyone's trying to solve uh, for education that I think would make a very big difference. Um, AI, um, the use of AI has been talked about and thrown about a lot, uh, but that's actually a very difficult problem to apply in education, um, specifically in areas of helping teachers, right? For example, um, I would like to just frame it in a simpler way. I think there are three main areas that uh, we see moving forward. One is helping teachers do what they are doing now, but in a much better way. Two is rethinking what we can do and what's possible in education, right? And three, it's really about providing access to education um, around the world because now it's really limited by, for example, 
teachers. Um, if we think about all of these, what are some of the things that are really difficult problems? Specifically, for example, if we zoom in, right? Um, personalized learning is one of those holy grails of education that is really difficult to solve. Um, and it is something that uh, I'm sure everyone's working on, but the ability to do that um, at the moment, it's really by a teacher who understands the student. Um, in terms of the trends, and one of the most important things I just wanted to talk about very quickly was, um, we talk about education, we talk about technology, and we talk about ed tech. The most important thing that we see, and we see the ones that, success, that are most successful, are the ed techs that remember and keep the student at the center of their universe. The learner is more important than anything else. Education is all about the student and the humans. It's not about the technology, right? We need to keep this in mind that allows us to build the best ed techs to support our students to learn and to develop and to grow. Okay. Hey, thanks, Ivan. Uh, I think I think now I'll open up uh, the questions from the audience. There's a there's a whole lot of stuff and very interesting questions. Um, I think uh, during this conversation, even I have some questions reserved, which I'll ask in the end. Uh, so uh, let me start with the first question, which I saw from um, Han. Uh, very interesting. I think this is something which we have been seeing quite a lot of times. What happens after COVID-19? Um, so uh, this is something a lot of people say that after COVID-19, will the schools again move into completely the classroom-based learning or is uh, still the hybrid learning which is which will keep on continuing will the technology will start focusing i think i think those are the questions which is a very generic question which even we uh, are being asked by many many uh, you know investors or even sometimes uh, even the audiences uh, the market so uh, i think uh, anyone from the panel can answer this question uh, probably i can i can drop it to mr jj if he can answer this question Okay. Because he has gone through that two decades. So yeah, so it's interesting because uh, um, we went through SaaS. My company was started. Uh, we we launched our product in year two thousand. Uh, honestly, the first three years was quite difficult to sell to the schools. I have teachers telling me that uh, look, I see my students every day. Why do I want to see them when I go home? You know, why do I need e-learning solutions? So on one hand, you have the government trying to push it through IDA. Um, MOE didn't quite push a lot. They left it to schools and there wasn't a lot of funding left to, let for the schools to decide. So e-learning wasn't a big thing. But after SARS, they realized it was important and suddenly the market uh, became very big because um, the schools were told to go and find a solutions and so on. A mindset also changed. The teacher's mindset, nobody is asking a question, why do we need e-learning? They're just asking what features, how will they meet my needs, right? So... Now back to COVID, COVID is a much more prolonged um, crisis than SARS. In fact, thankfully, when COVID happened, there were a lot of free solutions already out in the market. If it had happened um, 10 over years ago during the SARS period, there were very few open tools out there uh, that could solve the problems. Um, really, many of the learning had to stop. But with COVID, um, people were pushed to use Zoom, they were pushed to use all sorts of uh, different like free tools like uh, Google Drive or whatever, um, ways to share things. Uh, those schools already have all their e-learning platforms so they could um, find that solution. Of course, the, uh, the challenging thing is I, I see some of the questions in the, um, by the guests um, um, com um, highlighting some of the struggles that parents have with uh, home-based learning, whether teachers really design well, whether like a lot of the learnings have, have been pushed to the parents and then they have to struggle with it. But I think it is more of getting acceptance. Mm -hmm. Now, moving forward, what do I think will happen? Uh, COVID itself um, has really opened up a lot of people's mind to um, accepting online learning as a, maybe a substitute for tuition, for example. In Singapore, it's so easy for us to travel to tuition centers, right? But in other countries where uh, e this uh, online education has taken off earlier than Singapore, like China or, or some countries where very big geographical location and very bad traffic jams. Um, people have already started to use uh, online solutions to replace tuition. In Singapore, that happened because of COVID. And then, uh, like Mr. Earl was sharing, that maybe in future, schools could have less, uh, can have some days where, more days when the uh, students 
can stay at home. They already started this since uh, SARS time that there are some e-learning days, but not many. So you'll see a lot more of that. Um, you'll see a lot more acceptance of uh, online degrees by top universities. So I think definitely COVID has launched a whole new market. There'll be a lot more funding, a lot more innovation in this. Um, it's definitely going to be quite exciting going forward. I'm sorry, can I, can I just add that uh, we have uh, COVID-19 now. After COVID-19, we do not know when will be the next pandemic. So <laughs> it's something that takes years for us to prepare, just to prepare that there could be another big one coming. We can't tell. But uh, my view about EdTech is that EdTech should make life easier for everybody, including the parents. So we have to find a solution to that. And then the, my comment about the home-based learning and online learning is, you see, education is not just uh, pumping knowledge into the head of our kids and then hope that they will be able to apply this knowledge. It's more than just uh, acquiring knowledge. There's a lot of other things which they are supposed to learn in the school. Like for example, socializing, work together with other, care for fellow students, care for the poorer society and so on. There are a lot of other ethics and so on to make them good citizens, you see. But what we do not know is that if, how do we strike a balance between uh, in-person and online learning? Will online learning uh, have an impact on this aspect of education? And there's something that uh, I don't think we, any, anybody has started research in this area yet. So that, that could open up another area of research for, for people who really are interested in knowing the impact of uh, online learning in the long run for kids. Especially in education, it takes about 12 years for the educators to know whether the system is, 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 is good or bad, you see, because a, a kid go through 10 or 12 years of, of school, at the end of which, we may find that, hey, we are producing an illiterate, you know, or we're producing poor citizens. So it takes a long time actually to find out. So this, these are all the challenges uh, that we have to face. But EdTech should make life easier for teachers, for students, for parents. I think that, that should be the, the crux of it, right? And those are my few comments. Uh. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mr. Moore. I think uh, the next question, which I see is from Oscar. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, that's that the question itself is like another discussion which we have been going through is like, uh, how much importance is social interaction contributing to the process of learning? And, uh, you know, some of the topics like philosophy and politics, do you think online has those capabilities of delivering those sessions? So I think I can, I can ask Michael because he has been involved in the academic side. Uh, what, what's your thought on this or what do you, what do you have to answer to ask her? It's a, it's a very big question. And <laughs> you can write books about it or books have been written about it. And I think it's also very subjective perspective. But my take on it is that um, an online session can never replace, replace, replace in a literal sense, a face-to-face -face session. It is an alternative a medium to teach. And it can be used instead of a face-to-face -face session, then you don't need to have a very uh, interactive um, or very applied kind of learning environment. And um, so online learning should and will uh, get more traction and will take more time out of overall, uh, overall scheme of, of education. But um, of course, it also depends on the topic. If it's very knowledge-based, um, or maybe language learning. There are many technologies where a face-to-face -face session, offline session can, can actually, is not required or to a much lesser degree. But in, in many areas, where more applied learning is required, number one, as, as well as social interaction. I mean, you can't uh, learn how to swim by reading a book, right? And you'll never know how to ride a bike by reading a book or watch a video. You get some skills and knowledge, but it can never replace the, the actual thing, right? The actual skill. And then uh, as far as it's more skills-based, as far as social interaction is, is concerned, I strongly believe some part, and that's a big question, 
uh, how much, but um, a good part has to be offline to learn skill sets and social interaction and, and, and different um, skill sets, which, which are equally important in, in nowadays environment and in, at, the, at the workplace. Yeah, thanks, Michael. I think uh, Karthik had raised his hand uh, uh, to ask a question. I think we can unmute him uh, if you want to ask. So, Sandesh, it's not a question. If in case that's uh, okay by the protocol, I had uh, an observation on the on one of the questions that you have asked. If that's okay. Sure, sure. I mean, sure. Uh, we have to. So the the yeah. this is around the question that you had raised that. What should you call yourself as an as a company? So many of us from the tech industry fall in this in this big uh, conundrum of whether we are call us an education company, a tech company, etc. And I think we struggled as a, a tech company ourselves when we had started off. But finally, the answer came very very obvious, uh, and the answer is very clearly: Who is your customer? And the moment because you only serve a customer. If the customer is a student, then you are an education company. But if the customer is an institution, then you are a tech platform company. And, and, that, and I think uh, that defines the way uh, we grow, the way we are able to market ourselves, the way we are able to value ourselves. All of that depends on um, how we are. So it's same like saying, what is Mustafa? Is Mustafa a supermarket or is it a real estate company? Uh, so very clearly, it's a supermarket. It's just a platform. End of the day, it's a platform, but it doesn't call itself a platform. It calls itself a supermarket. So I think uh, uh, any company, be that be AWS or Baiju's or uh, Blackboard, each one of them can call themselves what they are, depending on who the end consumer is. And I think that's a very, very important question that you raised. If you don't and not able to answer it, uh, then we are stuck in this conundrum and we are all are marketing and uh, Communication goes for a toss. Hey, thanks, thanks, Karthik. I think I think uh, what you just said is makes a lot of value. And how do we perceive ourselves rather than getting into a into a quadrum of uh, just confusing ourselves whether we are in a tech uh, education or a technology rather than we see ourselves we want to brand ourselves into different markets or different segments. I think yeah, I think I that's add, a valid point. Thanks. Yeah. May yeah. I add here, in the early days, and this is 2000, uh, 2010, 2012 days when we were, I was running 24X online, which were one of the largest LMS and content development companies then. One of the problems was we, when we call ourselves as an edtech company, because nobody wants to associate with an edtech company. They want to associate themselves with a technology which will help them teach. That's all. So the moment you, you say it's e-learning, the end consumer in a corporate was worried. He doesn't know because he's very worried about doing e-learning. But the moment you say that, you know, you just have to come train yourself and it's available on URL so-and-so with a US user ID password, he was very comfortable. But the moment you say you have to do e-learning, that was putting off the end client itself. So sometimes the word e-learning and online learning and that they can be deterrent in itself. Sounds good. It all depends upon you know these terminologies which have come. I mean, this ed tech, HR tech, fintech. This is all like have started coming in last five years. You know, before that there was only technology, there was only education. So I think the moment this terminology sure. started coming into the market, that's where the confusion has been more often. So I think yes. moving to the next yeah. question is from uh, Sulpi. She says that uh, how do you ensure that hundred percent participation into online session? Uh, I think I can take this question because uh, we have been working very extensively on this part uh, because uh, we have been seeing a lot of video platform and this is the common, uh, you know, uh, stress which most of the parents have, you know, they, the students log in, they see the sessions, but they don't know how much they have been able to uh, understand from those online sessions. So this is where I think uh, as XPCO, I can, I can just uh, say that uh, we have been working on this space. We have been seeing that how the effective online learning can happen through live assessments. And there's a lot of interactive during our live sessions, which at least is uh, you know, helping a student and a parent to, to know that how much he has been able to understand from that particular session. So uh, moving forward, yes, I think there'll be a lot of more innovation in this space also where we can have, like we are already seeing some phase uh, 
you know, authentication and face recognition devices, which can capture the emotions of a student, whether he's a happy or whether he's a sad. So all these things have already gone through. We had done some beta also into that. Uh, and we'll see more and more such things coming in so that we can see how the online learning uh, can be more effective, just like the classroom sessions. Um, okay, um, one more question from uh, Richard is, I have some multiple questions from Richard, which says that, okay, uh, with, with the deconstruction of the traditional model of learning, a tech can provide flexibility of learning at students' own pace and schedule. Yes, that's, that's an advantage. But uh, one more question he has asked is, will there be a Netflix in education? Uh, probably, you know, uh, Ivan would be the right person to answer this. So um, I'm gonna just approach that from an idea of choice, right? And when we have a buffet of things, um, I think one of the problems, if you want to take a step back at it, is really how do you know where to start? In pedagogy, we actually have a very clear framework on things like what are foundational knowledge, what do you need to do in order to build onto the next stage and what, and so on and so forth. Um, so the problem with the idea of a buffet, just an empty buffet, for example, is it's, it may not really be the best way to approach teaching and learning, especially when it comes to knowledge, right? There are some things that are suitable. There are some things that may not. Will we see something like that as a buffet? Yes, definitely. But I think the bigger question we really want to think about is, is it suitable, right? Um, and, and is it the best way of doing it? Um, there are certain things, especially younger students who need a bit more structure. Um, there may be some things that are more suitable for a buffet. Uh, I think it's something that there is a space for everyone to think about. But from a pedagogical perspective, we need to know what is suitable rather than say that, you know, this is something that everyone would benefit from. There's actually a huge buffet of library of learning videos out there. Um, but we all know that we don't watch all of them, right? And if you critically think about it yourself, why do I not enjoy some of these videos? Or why do I not watch some of these videos? Um, you'll find a huge number of different reasons. Uh, and those, that, that exactly is the answer. Um, sometimes it's just the quality. Sometimes it's because I don't have the prerequisite knowledge. Sometimes it's because the way it explains is wrong. But we do need to think about what is the best way to empower our kids and our learners, not necessarily kids, but learners, to be able to learn on their own, at their own pace. And this is something where I agree that the decoupling part is very important and very powerful. Thanks, Ivan. Uh, I think yeah, even, even I feel that we are not there yet, you know, uh, in terms of OTT. Uh, in fact, we also had some discussion with the OTT platforms where we are seeing as that uh, to deliver the content through OTT platform, but I still feel, no, I mean, still the market is not ready for that uh, because it's, it's more of a one-sided, unless we come up with a innovation where we can have a much larger interactive kind of a sessions. Um, moving to the next question, which is quite interesting. And I think uh, Michael would be the right person to answer is there are a couple of questions which has been bundled. Um, one is, uh, do you think the concentration span of a children in online is much, much lesser compared to the offline sessions? Uh, one. Uh, the second question, which is a follow-up question, which is like, uh, how do you create an emotional touch with peers and teachers uh, when you move into the online? So we presume that, um, you know, tomorrow we have more and more hybrid learning concept. Uh, will that same environment or same effectiveness of a classroom learning can be converted into an online space? Me, Sandesh. You yeah, unmute. Yeah, Michael, go ahead. Okay, okay. I'm not sure if I'm the best person. I, I think that's actually a question for everyone. Uh, uh, but um, I, I think uh, as as to to keep the concentration span, concentration span is is shorter online. I think for me that's a clear cut. Yes, that's that's pretty much the answer to the question. Face to face interaction where you can have a lot more. Uh, emotions and it's easier to monitor and all of us have probably run certain workshops etc it's very difficult to keep the attention span you can always turn the camera off look at how many people turn the camera off here right that, 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 that's a standard one um, and it, to make essentially the life of a teacher or facilitator easier any session needs to be more interactive a lot of gamification and there are lots of interesting tools around people just need to learn it 
uh, and need to, need to know how to deal with it, right? And we, we have all kinds, you can do different games where, you know, typical ones are Mentimeter, for example, different surveys, and you can, can show and you can get immediate feedback, don't need to hand out papers, etc. I need to wait after the class. And again, you can use video based uh, uh, learning and make it make it interactive. So all kinds of different uh, solutions. So if there are definitely room for improvement. But I think it's generally more difficult for a teacher or a, a trainer or facilitator to keep their attention. Also, I mean, age makes another difference, right? Because children, they get easily distracted. We also get distracted. If we're honest to ourselves, I get distracted as much as you are and kids even, even, even more. So that's, that's more difficult if you're forced to attend the class or you volunteer and sign up for a course. That's also a different the motivation behind, right? You pay for it. You don't pay for it. All these things may influence also your attention span. But, but, but overall speaking, as mentioned, I think online is, is a harder job. Uh, but 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 definitely, there are more tools to be used to make it a little easier and to make it more impactful. Okay, thanks, Michael. Oh, we have one question for Pankaj from an investor panel. <laughs> so I think, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, Mr. Jerry Lee has asked. And I think it's more from the from the investment side and how do uh, the capital market see uh, as a startup. So uh, his question is like, uh, there are two models. There are there are tech solution which focuses on kids. There are tech solution which focuses on uh, uh, teachers. From your perspective, what do you see in the future? Is where the valuation will go and jump in. It's, it's, it will be more focused towards the students, more focused towards teachers. Um, just, to, just to hear your broader thoughts. I think it's, it's, it's a bit of a tough question to answer it, but I think uh, you can share your thoughts on this. It is it is it is tough and interesting question because I I, I don't think that valuation should be uh, the factor uh, or, or valuation should be a criteria of, of, of success right I I, I truly believe that uh, whether that particular startup is solving the right problem statement or not whether this this the startup is creating the right solution uh, for the for the targeted audience or not obviously there'll be requirement for the for the startups that are solving problem statement of the of the, of the kids of the students and then there is a requirement of the startups that are solving uh, problem statements of the of the uh, education institutions right because obviously they have to manage complete admin and payroll and fee structure and lms and everything um, sometimes in a in a very manual manner uh, however it would be fantastic to see um, Amazons in the edtech, uh, Amazons of the of the of the world in the in the in the edtech space, where you know one startup is solving the whole problem statement really really well, and uh, and I also I also saw a couple of comments uh, in the chat section. People are more worried about the abundance of the solution rather than lack of the solution. There are so many applications to download. There is so much content to watch. There are so many uh, different platforms uh, that talk about you know teaching this, teaching that, or doing this for the for the institutions or doing that for, for the institution. And I think this is a very early stage, I believe, uh, of the of the ed tech transformation. And uh, uh, all the startups that are, you know, uh, that have been built in last three, four years or that are being built now, they all have this huge pressure of growing as fast as possible. Because if you don't grow as fast as possible, then probably either you'll be acquired or you'll be killed by your competition. Most in, in 90 or 95% of the cases, probably you'll be killed by your competition. So that's why all these startups have this huge pressure of growing as fast as possible so that they can survive, you know, after five years or 10 years, and they can be one of the leaders after, after 10 years. And I think a lot of that consolidation is going to happen. And, uh, and I think that's when the education system will be slightly more structured, more organized, and uh, probably kids and uh, teachers and learners and everybody will have a uh, uh, more structured solution for, for them to you know, move forward. Till then, there'll be a lot of chaos, a lot of solutions, a lot of you know, uh, uh, different uh, options to choose from. That's, that's, what, that's what I feel. That's what I feel. I don't know if I answered the question, but that was my general thought on this whole space. 
Yeah, I think I think it's still it's still a larger market. You know, we are we are talking about parents. There are various different stakeholders. I mean, uh, it it all depends upon what kind of solution or product you are able to give to those end users. I think uh, that would be the key to define what value you bring into the system. So uh, I think there's one more question, Mr. Yen and Wu had asked. I think uh, it's it's just a, a question which I had framed it differently. But uh, I'll ask Mr. Erkong what. Uh, again, that question: Do you think you know uh, the early stage startups if they really want to work with MOE? Because of course we have seen when you are working with governments and Ministry of Education, there's a whole lot of criteria. The entry point itself is quite difficult you know, to to work with. Do you think there should be more freedom? Uh, there should be more openness to work with those kind of startups. And is there a possibility that government changing uh, those kind of policies where they can adopt these startups to work with them closely in in developing these kind of systems? I think it's more a question of uh, needs, whether the ministry is able to fulfill that kind of needs. If not, then we sort of uh, subcontract out to another company or startup. One area which is uh, which might have been overlooked is the teacher training. All our teachers are trained to teach in front of a group of students in a classroom. Okay, but I don't think we have a uh, started training teachers to teach in front of a camera, okay? So in future, the, the teacher is, is got to be a star, a performer, so that students will look forward to lock, locking in for the session, you see? Otherwise, they get bored. So I think that that is one of the things that, uh, that I'm not too sure whether the Ministry or the, the National Institute of Education uh, is looking into or not. But the, the method of delivery in a classroom and the method of delivery through a camera may be different. How to hold the attention of the students and how to make sure that the student is actually his client, that the client will still come back to subscribe to his, uh, his product or her product, you see. So I think there's some, some, some something that we can think about. But if you're talking about technology and all that, it's very, very competitive, you see. And, uh, and it's quite a challenge because the ministry, they, they will have a certain definition of what they want. And uh, in a way, normally we look in-house first and only if we cannot get it, then we either develop it or subcontract out. The subcontract out is something that it goes through a, a very tedious process, you know. So, um, and there's always a fear that it may not work when it may fail, you see. So, um, so these are the kind of challenges. You know? But unless you've got some things that are so unique, they're so different that it's, it's uh, a lot cheaper for the ministry to, to buy it. And uh, also Singapore is a small place. Huh? If something that's developed in a big country, the US or something like that, then it's a question of acceptance in the sense that some other people, some other organization have really readily accepted the system. Okay? But we are quite shy generally of try and error type of you know, venture because if we fail, there's a lot to answer to everybody. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Mr. Wong. I think uh, there's a bit of time constraint, so we are not able to take up more questions. Uh, but definitely, uh, you can write to us, reach out. Uh, we are we are very happy to to able to answer those questions. Uh, um, you can reach us at LinkedIn, and uh, you know we'll also drop in uh, email. Um, let me take this time to thank everyone. I think it's an uh, it was an excellent uh, discussion we had with the panel, and uh, there are a lot of insights which we take from this particular event, and. Um, I'm hoping that uh, we continue to have these kind of sessions in the future. I think there's a lot more to be discussed. Um, as we are seeing in the questions and the people chatting, I think uh, one hour is not enough or one session is not enough to have uh, a discussion about something which is, which is growing massively. Um, uh, I think for me, uh, or uh, the key takeaways from this particular event is we believe that there's a lot of responsibility on us. It's, it's, it's an exciting, it's, it's a lot of opportunities, but. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity because the stakeholders are quite uh, 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 quite a many. It's not just uh, the schools, the teachers, it's kids. You know, we are we are trying to build a next generation. 
and uh, there's a lot of dependency and when the things are slowly moving from a classroom to an online learning the dependency of learning also is moving from a classroom to online learning, uh, learning so i think it it also adds a lot of pressure for all the edtech players in delivering the right kind of uh, the content right kind of quality education so uh, yeah thanks thanks again um, i think uh, over to you pankaj if you want to add something uh, oh i mean uh, it was definitely a very very fantastic session and uh, i i wish we could have, have we could have gone for hours and hours uh, on the on this topic but one thing that i want to uh, say is that this is just the beginning of our relationship right uh, you heard sandesh talking ashu was in the background uh, helping sandesh please connect with the founders they are doing fantastic work and the the best thing is that they are really excited and passionate about what they are building so would love to reconnect with you later and see how we can work together there are possibilities of partnerships there are possibilities of you know uh, working together or, or i'm sure uh, we would we would love to you know connect over a coffee or or chat about the whole ecosystem so let's let's reconnect and take it from there okay thanks everybody for joining really appreciate your time and we'll talk to you soon take care stay safe